Hi, hello everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you all joining us today. Uh, my name is Evan Snyderman, co-founder of R & Company, a design gallery in New York City. And um, today's discussion is titled Failed Seriousness, uh, an intellectual conversation about how we live with objects and questioning the essence of decor. The conversation originated um, between Servan Ionescu, uh, one of our panelists today, and Lapo Benazzi, uh, founder of the Italian radical design group UFO. Um, this, this conversation can be read in its entirety on our website. Um, there's an exhibition, a virtual exhibition with the same title, Failed Seriousness, and you can read uh, the excerpts from their conversation. Um, failed seriousness, you know, the reason is the real, the, the reason behind this uh, discussion today. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the goals of our gallery is to create a dialogue around historical and contemporary design. And the radical design movement, which I'm showing some slides uh, as we're talking, uh, was really born in Italy in the mid 1960s. And it set about a change um, to the design and architecture landscape that we're still unpacking today. Um, it was a mashup of disciplines um, be between uh, really the level of uh, communication around an idea. And it bolstered the Italian radical designers in their day to challenge the conventions of their fields, combining art, theater, design, architecture, and fashion something that I felt these panelists are doing with their own careers today. And it's a, it's a conversation and a topic that we want to see continue, um, creating dialogue around objects. And a lot of the Italian radical designers were also very much involved in performative design, which is something that both Servan, uh, sorry, the, the, the panelists today are, are also equally doing. So let me introduce you to our panelists now. Um, we have with us today Servan Ionescu and uh, Sam Stewart. Um, and the conversation is going to be moderated by Christina De Leon, um, a curator of decorative arts and design. And I'm just going to give you a quick intro to uh, these folks. And I thank them all for, for joining us today. This is wonderful to have you guys. Um, Servan Ionescu, uh, born in Romania raised in Queens. I love saying that because it reminds me of my, one of my favorite LL Cool J songs. Um, <laughs> but Servan's work, Servan's work, ex, you know, is, is really exciting. Um, it, it explodes out of the sense of, of the idea of automatic drawing using instinctual lines that pop with color. Servan creates sculptural collages that bring together the practices of both design, fine art, and architecture. Sam Stewart, a New York-based artist uh, whose work resembles and functions as household furniture and domestic objects, uh, is most interested in eliciting a heightened simplicity and exaggerated satisfaction of looking. Now, it might sound abstract. These are ideas that push boundaries of what design is meant to be, and that's what we love, and that's the idea of this conversation today. Um, now, Christina De Leon is a curator of, of historical and contemporary design that focuses on the decorative arts of the Americas. Um, Christina, thank you so much for, for hosting and moderating today's conversation. And um, I hope you all enjoy it and we look forward to some enthusiastic questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Evan, uh, for that great introduction. I'm delighted to be part of today's program. Um, and I thought we should kick off our conversation with this brilliant image of Lapo Benassi, um, who is with us in spirit. Um, and I hope with today's conversation, you'll see how his work has uh, influenced Serban and Sam's practice, along with so many contemporary designers uh, working today. 
So uh, for those of you who have not yet read the email exchange between Servin and Lapo, which is posted on the Failed Seriousness uh, exhibition page, there is a wonderful line from Serbin who wrote to Lapo, quote, your work to me does not belong in architecture, design, or art, but to life. And life is no fun if it's too serious, um, which I think it's a great line to juxtapose with um, this coat stand, which is an object many of us might have in our um, in our apartments or our office spaces, um, but which is transformed into this incredible object that might attack you or hurt you or might just bring you some smiles. Um, so when Serbin first shared with me that this online exhibition was going to take place, I instantly thought, what a perfect match. Um, seeing the work together, an obvious dialogue arises, um, whether that be with the use of materials, as in this case, um, with steel, um, or uh, when reconfiguring the function of an object, um, like this work by Lapo on the left, uh, which uh, uses an umbrella um, or the shape of an umbrella to also serve as a light. Um, and in Serbin's case, considering the way an inanimate chair uh, can embody the human gesture of a hug. Um, and as I got to know the work of Sam, um, I clearly saw affinities between him and Lapo Benazi too. Um, in particular, the whimsical characteristics of, of their work and the embrace of the absurd, like this wheel of cheese that breaks up to become cushions, um, or this large inf inflatable fabric which is transformed in, into um, a lamp. And I, I would encourage you to look up further images of these objects because you really see sort of the scale and um, the whimsicality of, of both of these um, designs uh, in, in the space. And so one thing that we wanted to kind of kick us off with is, is thinking about um, the moment in which Lapo Benassi and his contemporaries emerged um, in Italy, which was in the midst of environmental, social, and political crises that were um, taking hold of the country. Um, and this began first with the flood of Florence that we have photographed here um, in 1966, which as you can see inundated the city. Um, and also the Italian student movement in 1968. And so for this talk, we thought we would consider Serbin and Sam's design practice uh, within the framework of our own current crises, uh, the COVID-19 health pandemic, which has taken hold of um, all of our lives and has had enormous ripple effects throughout our society. Um, and in particular, a connection with objects we interact with every day. So, um, we are going to start our conversation off um, by just showing a few images of how, in particular, New York City has changed so much um, and the way we enter spaces. Um, and then once we enter those spaces, what we're confronted with, this is uh, an image that is not unlike many images that were circulated when we were all asked to shelter in place, which was this fear of being without, without having enough supplies um, and um, wanting to sort of hoard and, and make sure you had everything at home um, to get you through um, this lockdown. And so uh, throughout this conversation, 
Serban will begin to talk a bit about his work and his practice. Um, Sam will chime in along the way, and then we'll transition to Sam, um, and then we will end and open it up for questions. So, Serban, want to start us off? Of course, thank you. Uh, yeah, kind of. The, it's it's amazing to be paired uh, next to such a legend like Lapa Binazi and. In our email exchange, you know, one of the questions I was like, "How how do we, how can we look at objects now with with this new lens that's kind of opened up for us? Objects that are now with us constantly in our living rooms, in our in our background of our Zoom meetings. How do these constantly? We're so much more in exchange with the objects that we've maybe at first collected just for mere need." But now that lamp or chair, or whatever it is, it's become a little bit more, has a little bit more substance. So I was really kind of curious to see how this new lens um, will, let's say, inspire us or motivate us to make objects. Um, I am also talking to you guys from Canada. I'm quarantined. I've been here since March 1st. All of this happened. I decided to kind of stay here. Um, the work that's on the screen right now, it was... It was pre-COVID, but it was, I created this work in mind with making work somewhere else or making work on the go. I was really, I knew I was gonna come here for a short period of time. I was, gonna, I was gonna, supposed to be in Canada for four months. So I, with that in mind, I was like, how can I make work continuously? Because my studio is in Brooklyn. And I kind of started, okay, I'm gonna make small objects. I'm gonna make objects that I could, I don't need a big shop to, to use. Um, I could paint them myself. So all these things, I started, kind of created this, this type of kind of scaled object, which you see right now. So these were, I call them ships. Ships for many reasons. They're kind of the size of a vessel or a vase. Uh, that's one thing. Ship, because there's a relationship between the pieces that are kind of bolted together. Uh, ship, because there's also a relationship between colors. And uh, next slide, please, Christina. So you will see, I'm kind of carrying them. So, that, but also with this in mind, okay, I can make this work somewhere else, but also, or I can make it anywhere in the world, but also I wanted to, for them to exist almost as scaleless in some way. Uh, next slide, please, Christina. And scaleless in the sense that I wanted them, they could be anything. So with that parallel to this, me being stuck in Canada, I've been making a watercolor a day. This has been my kind of, uh, I guess my uh, medicine to how to deal with some of the stresses that of the everyday. So I, I decided to make a, a watercolor day, but, but the watercolors, I've given them certain rules. I've, I'm using a ruler, I'm using a triangle, and I'm using a pencil. So it's, it's very few little instruments. They need to be almost drafted just to have some order to maybe the chaos of the mind, but also the chaos of the world. So I kind of started creating these objects. And these drawings are also, again, with that idea of, is it an object? Is it a piece of furniture? What is it? What's the scale of it? So again, these are some of the ideas that are kind of constantly going in. Uh, with that idea that there's, there, they deal with every scale. If, can we go to the next slide, Christina? So these were some of the beginning drawings. So kind of at the breakout of the pandemic, I was basically just drawing straight up architecture. Architecture is my background. and these were almost somewhat shelters. Maybe the, the top part of the structure is a solar panel roof or some sort. You can see the fence around the structure. This thing being on a platform that's almost on stilts, it could also be a table, it could be something else, or it could be just something abstract. So I was kind of starting to think about architecture, shelter, all these. And this is something that's shifting in my own work. I started out in architecture, I kind of abandoned the world of architecture, then I painted, I made sculpture, and I'm coming back to kind of consolidating all those, my background, my history. And recently I finished a project that I'm very much interested in continuing this type of work. And if, if we go to the next slide, Christina. This is Chapel for an Apple, and this is the first time I'm somewhat revealing this to the world. Um, and this is, Again, this could be two feet or it could be 20 feet. It's actually 20 feet tall. But uh, 
it's it's in upstate New York, and this was completed early last year. Oh, sorry, late last year, and this is somewhat where I'm kind of interested. So, kind of going from those kind of maquettes that I showed you, those small ships. I'm, I'm interested in that the work kind of travels through all these different scales. It, it could turn into architecture, it could turn into furniture, it could turn into a small tabletop. I'm very interested in kind of shifting this idea of, of objects. Um, shifting this idea of objects. And, uh, um, this is kind of a small thought of Zina. So it's kind of the first piece of sculpture that you can answer. I can enter. And the next slide, yeah. And the next slide, yeah. Serbin, something that um, I think is really interesting that's happening in the world is your interest, interest in going back to architecture. Um, can you talk a little bit about this break that you had with architecture? This break um, after you finished um, architecture school, you had a big experience of a space with actually working in the architecture field and that disconnect you had. Yeah, it, it emerged. I graduated from architecture school and working in architecture for a little bit. A little bit that I talked about a little bit with Lop as well. Um, and and, and uh, cause a lot of those Italian radical guys had studied architecture or architecture and then they decided to do furniture and interiors. So I kind of worked a little bit in architecture field, but then I, I, I needed something a little bit more needed to more helpful. Hence, I for something that I have more control of. And, and I kind of buried it for many reasons. It was because it was, it, you know, the architecture world is also insanely serious. The title of the show felt seriousness. It, I felt like everything that I was, I was constantly uh, up to the wall of that seriousness of, of things being, and it wasn't part of me, it didn't really like vibe with my personality. So, um, and, and then kind of studying painting and working with painting, working in stuff, I therefore, I kind of left it behind and then kind of like buried it, in, in, but only up until maybe four years ago where it resurfaced. And then that resurfacing started, I started using it in making objects. That's one of the objects that you see in the objects you'll see after. But, uh, and in that, I, I kind of kept resurfacing. Other ideas started resurfacing. I started using some of the techniques, like building maquettes, building certain things in the studio. So I, I immediately embraced my past in some way, which was something that I rejected for a long time and then and buried it. So now I'm kind of resurfacing it, and this chapel for Annapolis is one of the first projects that I really like embraced that past. And I was like, okay, let's let's go big. Great, thank you. And I, I think we were having a little bit of audio issues, but I I think it's been worked out now. Okay. There's Sam. So again, um, Sarvin, can I uh, interrupt for one second? Of course. Um, I'm curious, like, you know, Evan was discussing your drawing technique um, as being automatic. And I'm curious, like, to what extent these um, kind of architectural drawings, like, is it a combination of, of um, automatic and, and kind of planned or like more, I'm not sure, like, the pandemic drawings are automatic. I never know what I draw. So I'm using these tools like the triangle or the, the ruler in some way. I'm, it's not a ruler just for a straight edge, the straight edge. I'm right. using that just as, as a mirror. It's just a tennis court, right? It's just a basketball court that I'm playing in. Inside there, I'm playing basketball with my foot. I'm playing, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm putting the racket in between my, you know, in my armpit, you know, like it's, there's no rules once I start drawing. It's kind of just kind of, um, kind of impulsively kind of, mutates. Yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it's, it's interesting because it feels like somewhat loose and controlled at the same time, especially when you see the works realized in 
real space like this slide that we're currently looking at. I mean, yeah. it does it does feel like there's a combination um, of the two, even when you know I'm not seeing the drawing necessarily for this piece, but it's it still feels like there's some I don't know there's a there's a kind of trueness between the drawing and, and the actual piece itself. I always try to I always try to have that, Sam. I'm always you know I'm I'm interested in that there is these these layers that I'm working with that. That, you know, because we talked about like the Matisse cutouts and you know, other other artists that you know have this way of like transforming the drawing into three dimensions, but without losing the quality of, of the sketch or the hand. Of course, I try I try to have that kind of that 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 sensitivity to it, I guess. But it also emerges from from because coming from like a strict, let's say architectural past, it was, it, everything was, every line had to have a certain meaning, right? So I was trying to break that by like going towards the cartoon, going towards the, like the doodles, the, the table side, you know, like on top, you know, on the side of your notebook kind of doodles. So that's where kind of these, my drawings and these kind of, I, this notion of impulse kind of emerged out of, and I wanted to, to clash that or intersect that with, with, you know, a material, a color, uh, a function, um, and then that's when these things kind of just, just transmutated into this. Yeah, totally. And these were kind of going back to the chapel. It's, uh, so the chapel is this thing now that you could go come inside. And then, but before that, I was interested in this notion of characters. You know, I love cinema. I love, uh, I love the, that potentially an object could carry uh, the same live as a as, as a pet right in your room right uh, that lamp becomes activated it's almost it's there always you kind of you see it in different light maybe because of your emotions or so on and so on so it's I, I kind of start seeing my objects as, as as pets in some way I call them I, they're named in a certain way they always have a name like a singular name um, and like the purple uh, kind of table-ish thing in the in the forefront here it's called Annie and uh, so there, there were, you know, I was really thinking about them as them as pets. And now chapel is this kind of more of a shelter, more of a, a vessel, more of a ship idea. So kind of the next, I guess, phase would be to put all these characters in the ship. I don't know. That's, that's, I could still, I'm still thinking about what that is. But uh, yeah, next slide, please, Christina. And this is a little bit of that, right? Putting these things together. I always try to do all my shows somewhat of a, and as an installation, uh, I want them to kind of, this was kind of, I was inspired by kind of Fellini's Satyricon kind of sets. And I love the costumes, the characters, the actors in, the, in them, these amazing costumes behind this kind of like Roman like uh, background. So I wanted to kind of, you know, I wanted to work with that a little bit, kind of using my my pieces as characters in this kind of film set of some of sorts, kind of having that theatrics to it. This was at R and Company last year. And uh, next slide, please. And kind of parallel to this, like we were talking the other day, and I was like, hey, I feel like sometimes I'm I'm in I'm in a couple different bands, right? So this is more like my garage band, right? This is where I'm kind of like my solo garage band. So this, these are my folk chairs, which. I was when I start started making these uh, these this tributary of work. It was I wanted to make something quick. I wanted to make something with some of my leftover pieces from my metal works. It was some leftover materials, and they kind of evolved kind of that with kind of the Balkan chair. The so I kind of was also looking in my own past, in my Romanian past, and seeing looking at some of the furniture, some of the folk furniture from from uh, from there. And so it was a kind of this is kind of just, but again, they're characters, right? You see them, they're smiling, they're, they're, I want them to activate that space as well, that they're, I don't want them to be static as an object. Next slide, please. You can see it. This was an installation that I did at Safe Gallery in Brooklyn in 2018. So this is kind of the emergence. And just a small side note, uh, the blue chair in this is called Pinocchio, kind of because of the red nose and kind of these, uh, 
pink eyebrows. But that was literally the first chair. So I was not making furniture. I was not thinking about design. I was, I was working on my apartment and I started making furniture for my apartment. And that was Pinocchio, that blue chair was the first thing that I made completely out of being just needing to make an object for the house. And then from that things, that's when I was able to kind of tap into that deep design syntax that I buried or was shy of. And uh, then a lot of things emerged out of that. And I'm still kind of writing that way. Next slide. Is, is the, sorry, one second. Is the no red chair on the left, is that um, kind of a combination of the wood kind of full chair and, and metal or is it? That was because uh, some of them have like found objects or the found wood. The legs were just these found. So it's wood. It's all wood. And the legs were found, found legs. A friend gave me to okay. me. But these were all wood. These were just like things that I was just, you know, playing around with. It was just experimenting with these. And do you, do you like um, freehand cut the yes. wood pieces? Okay. So, so those I are like very so I treat them more like my my previous drawings, which they like kind of more they saw in the, in the previous slide. So I draw on top of the material that I'm about to cut. So I just draw. So it's a process of drawing and and transferring those drawings into a material, and then that becomes. So it's it's these these are very much about like these trials and errors. Like oh, I don't like how this thing came out. I don't like this cutout. So I'm constantly like exploring in these types of works. Where my other let's say steel works. Uh, those are kind of worked out. I work with them in the computer. I work with them, you know, they're, they're much more like I make sometimes maquettes of them. And so those are a little bit more worked out. These I never know what the hell I'm doing. Right. It's, but it's the, I think it's important to have that, you know, like I think it's important to have uh, and I kind of want to constantly have like some tributary where I'm like figuring things out where I'm, okay, this is my little, little experiment. So I kind of like that these folk chairs. Now I'm thinking about zombie chairs, you know, so whatever. It's just all these different things that are coming up in my, in my mind to kind of make quickly. Uh, and I'm making stuff in the backyard of this house that I'm staying in Canada now. So. I guess, well, sorry, when, before we move on. I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, it's always been a bit of a mystery to me, like with Gaetano Pesce's, some of his chairs that have like more figurative aspects to them and, and with yours as well, certain like, and, and, you know, different but similar capacity. Like, I mean, you, you, you discuss them as like friends, but I'm curious, like, you know, where, you know, and you discussed your apartment as well, but like where did the kind of impetus to like put a face or like kind of anthropomorphize uh, a chair or an object? Where where did that start for you? Uh, I, I, I it was always there. I always loved, you know, things on like stilts, right? So, but it, it, it emerged from this one moment and it was this kind of pivotal kind of moment. I was, I was hit by a car and, uh, and I was, uh, parallel to that, I was making abstract paintings. I was making somewhat abstract sculptures, but, and when I was, and I, my, my, I broke my right arm, my primary arm, and I started drawing. I was drawing with my other arm and I was drawing also kind of a little bit with my right hand. And I started drawing kind of these, these figures and they were all broken in pieces. So the, the arms, uh, they were kind of figurative drawings, so at first, but then I started breaking the figure, and, so, and, and when I broke the figure, I then, therefore, you could start seeing, okay, the arms, and if I had the arms kind of bent, I was like, oh, this looks kind of like a chair, and like the torso could be maybe the seat area, or the butt could sit on the butt, and the legs became, so I kind of, these, 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 these drawings that I was making around that time, they kind of started becoming these objects, and I didn't intend for it, it was just this kind of figuration that was just apply to my psyche at that time because I was broken. I felt so broken. I was just drawing bits. I called them bits. I was just in bits. And uh, I think that's where it kind of merged. Also, you know, I think like people, I, I, I think there is a certain reaction that I want at first. It's, it's also an entrance to someone, right? When someone sees a relatable face, I think it's a way to enter something, you know, and then you enter and you're like, oh, this is a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more complexity to this than than just a figure or just a face, right? I, I hope I hope uh, people see beyond the face, but uh, and uh, so it's a it's a way in, and it's also kind of has a little personal story as well.
And Sam, this is a piece that you made, and um, it was an interesting story when we were discussing, um, you know, what we would show and what kind of works and slides we would have included in this presentation. And because Serban's work is so obviously, um, you know, when, when you look at it, not, not only the face that you see in some of the pieces, but even just the cutouts, the gestures, it's, you can't help but see a character that's being formed or created um, with these types of chairs. And, and some, sometimes these chairs are functional, sometimes they're not so functional, um, sometimes they're um, uh, maybe even a little bit uh, dangerous <laughs> to interact with. And when we were chatting about this, you know, you brought up this chair and how you created this chair with a character in mind. And the thinking about it was very similar, I think, to Serban, but the outcome was so different. Um, and so I, I thought it would be really great if you could sort of talk about um, your your thoughts and your and your process in, in making this Angus chair. Yeah, so I think, you know, there is a lot of similarity um, in the way that Serban and I think. Um, I do feel like my starting point is that I kind of, pretty early on, like made associations that I think probably a lot of people do with furniture is that they just even in their like most normal form have some reference to the body. Um, you know, having legs, you know, having like a seat or a, or a backrest or all of these kind of, you know, anthropomorphic features that are just inherent in the way that, you know, they kind of accompany us and as well as you know how we perceive objects you know for our use and i think that that was like you know a pretty obvious realization but but when i started to consider that and how i wanted to create you know a piece for this this show at r and co um i was really thinking more from the starting point of like how would a chair look if it was awkward or Kind of like receding away from itself like kind of the wallflower at the like school dance um, and in particular i was reading a poem at the time that um the first two lines you know really struck me and and the poem's called the tale of the wandering angus or sometimes it's called the song of the wandering angus and it's you know it, it, it kind of talks about this more like internal aspect to regular life. I mean, walking around and having thoughts in your head that feel like they need to be expressed, but you know, how do you get those out? And, you know, there's just an introspective quality to it that I felt like that's like, that's what I wanted to capture in the chair. Um, so for me, it wasn't so much about like material, um, but simply how to like express something with, with relatively traditional material and, and traditional form. Um, but to communicate something that has a lot of character, like I think what Serban does um, very well in his own way, um, you know, I feel like I have to kind of approach it more through um, more recognizable forms, like something that almost looks like antique um, or, you know, kind of borrowing and sampling from different periods and styles. Um, but I think the desire to like communicate something you know characteristics is, is there like in a similar capacity in the i love it it's also kind of can't help not see sam like the maltese goddess right it's like uh, it has that or and the maltese goddess is then you kind of you're reminded of like brancusi's uh, the kiss right so it has that kind of those kind of has that deep syntax of this kind of old form which i love you know yeah and i mean i don't I don't want to like tell anybody like what to think when they see something that I make, but you know, for me, there's certain aspects of just very traditional furniture making that's suggestive, like the tuft, right? Like I put one tuft in the middle 
cushion and then the back rest. And I feel like that alone, just by isolating that and drawing attention to it, um, suggestive of, of many things, but, but it's more of like a hint, you know, it's, it's meant to kind of be part of a greater kind of character. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think it's possible to do it in many different ways. So you want your keys in your, in your band there? So that kind of goes back to me where I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> my, my little creature, you know, it's uh, with that in mind, you know, I think like I, I try to have some relatable kind of, kind of memory of syntax. It might, it might look like Predator from the, the film, you know, or it might have some uh, resemblance of something else. I don't know. This, this, this face for me seems so familiar, but I've never had ever made it or drawn it. So there was something about it that it was, I was kind of tapping within my own deep syntax of shapes and faces. Um, and, and then kind of this, yeah. For me, IHOP is, uh, I kind of like, I think this was, I was trying to do something more, um, more serious and I land on this, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's funny how that, how that happens, right? I always throw, I, I'm like, I'm always tripping myself up in some way, but in, in, in the best way I feel. Uh, next slide, please, Christina. I mean, they feel like they arrange themselves, like, you know, like, yeah. it's on a, like, this, this one could be many different variations, right? But it's almost like you froze this moment that it arranged itself into this configuration of a table, but it could be, you know, a chair or a stool or a lamp. I mean, you know, like within reason, but it of feels course. like it's, it has. Life. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it has, the, it's, I love that. I love that it gets kind of frozen within this kind of, kind of this arc of some sort within the, the story of these shapes and forms. And then this is just kind of like a, just an example of some of the, these evolutions, right to the left, is the roadie chair, and uh, this was something where I was, you know, it's figurative, it's also abstract. I was, I was, uh, kind of some of the shifts that I showed earlier, some of those mechanisms and the bolts and the kind of like the erector, erector set type ideas emerge a little bit in this in this object in this chair, and um, to the right you have Reese, where similar to the IHOP one prior, it's you can't, you know, it's frozen as, as, as a potential, you know, table, but it's, it's, it could be something else, you know, and I'm, I'm introducing in this one, uh, plexiglass, right? So it's the, the shadows, I'm thinking about the shadows that are now placed on the ground. So now it's bringing this yellow light to the ground. It's activating the ground now. It's activating how you're seeing certain colors through the blue, through the plexiglass. So this is kind of these small evolutions that are happening within the pieces. Um, and uh, next slide, please. And that, that's something that I'm kind of interested. This is a project that I actually did here under quarantine. This was, I did this like almost three months ago. And with this project in mind, I wanted to kind of, again, keep the scalelessness of the objects are a little bit, they're, they're not defined maybe by their scale at first, right? Uh, I like to photograph some of the objects on white just to give them this kind of placing in the world where it could be something like this or something enormous. And then I could extract from that. So with this, with this piece in mind, I was working with very limited tools. And with this, I wanted to create an object that's, at first, you're like, oh, this is a sculpture that's on the beach, right? And, and if you go to the next slide, please, Christina. Uh, it's, a, it's a chair and a table. So it's almost kind of, it reminds me a little bit of like those picnic uh, canteens where you you know, you have the cups and the, and the thermos, you know, and all the cups stack inside the thermos or like those luncheonette that have like the hot food. And so I, I was thinking about that a little bit, almost kind of like furniture on the go. I was even thinking maybe like putting this on your back in some form or another, like, and all you really need is a, a, a table and a chair in, in some way. So it was, you know, 
taking the abstract sculpture at first. So at first you don't know what it is. At first it might seem familiar. At first you might see the face. At first, you know, there's these things that kind of hint at things that might be familiar. Then you enter that. And then once you enter it, it's, it's I hope it then disrupts, it It reintroduces something, it, it makes something new. Uh, and then kind of, that's the, kind of the passage that I want, I guess, the observer to, to kind of travel through through some of these objects. And, but again, going back to Lapo uh, and, and the title of the talk and the show, it's, you know, it's this kind of seriousness that I, I want to eject a little bit, that I want to, I want to embrace the camp. I want to embrace, uh, you know, I want to embrace something that we have in us, humor and music and, uh, you know, these things that I would, you know, I taught for some time and I would always tell my students, like, you have to, you know, you have to eat well, you have to enjoy life, you have to do these things to, to become a better designer. These things, these things have to transfer in, in yourself. They're, uh, you're, you know, you're something that you're porous and you need to kind of bring these things in. And I want that to carry those things into my, into my work. I think next slide is... That might have been my, it's Sam. I think we're, we're gonna transition to Sam now. And I, I think that's a, a good um, last statement from you, Serban, because I think what we see in your work and Lapo Benassi's work and Sam's is that um, all of you are not afraid to experiment with materials, to um, mix styles and influences and to bring your life experience and your world into your work, however that might be. Um, and it's not necessarily about creating a very specific style or trajectory, but really experimenting with a lot of different types of um, aesthetics and imagery, forms, um, and, and Sam in particular, I, I think you are um, really successful in, in doing this because when, when you look at uh, a group of your work, um, it's so varied um, in materials, in aesthetic, um, in functionality. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to see sort of the range of exploration that you have in your practice. Um, and this uh, piece in particular, uh, which you did this year, I think is, is a great way to kind of set us off um, in, in talking about your work. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, you know, speaking very frankly, kind of um, quickly tire of certain materials or certain techniques. And you know, that's kind of like half of it. And then the other half is that I just, you know, I want to communicate what needs to be communicated with, you know, the given concept. So in this case, it was a chair that um, was intended to be eaten. And I felt like, you know, initially, um, there was a kind of a bread-like or a kind of um, inflated baked look to a lazy boy chair um, and it didn't seem out of the question to um, you know make this leap and you know the idea was to make it as convincingly as possible um, as a piece of bread but also as a lazy boy Can you speak a little bit to the performative aspect of sort of taking the bread or taking the, the chair apart, you know, similar into the way you would uh, sort of break off a piece of bread from a loaf that, that you have here pictured? Sure. I mean, you know, there was, there was really no instruction for like how someone was supposed to interact. You know, some people asked to like sit on it, um, to tear pieces off. Um, it really was pretty open-ended and even initially people were, I think, afraid to, 
you know, to even tear a piece off because it felt like it was finished and it felt very like complete. And, um, you know, there was a bit of uncertainty because we were working with bread in this scenario. You just weren't sure until literally the day of that the thing would turn out looking like it did. I mean, we made a prototype, but um, there's really one shot at, at getting it right. And, and you know, the idea was to have this leather-like material um, that could then be eaten. And it just seemed, um, you know, natural to involve other people in that process. And, and I think at the point too, I was working on another show and I just felt very much like pulled in many different directions. And, um, you know, this was a collaboration with a close friend of mine, Leila Gohar. And, you know, the, the, it just, it felt like something ephemeral needed to be made because it just, I kind of was at like, the peak of how much I could produce at the moment. So almost in some weird way, it like came out of necessity, even though as like crazy as that sounds. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but I mean, it was, you know, really pretty simple in how I wanted people to interact with just to simply enjoy it. And, it, and the bread was quite good. So it didn't hurt that the bakers who, who made this were very uh, good at what they do. So this is um, a much different work. This is a installation that you created for a mega gallery in Milan, Italy, um, which is really complex. And I'd love for you to sort of walk us through all of these elements that you created uh, for this show. Yeah, and, and just to begin with, I have to you know, apologize for any background noise because I'm, I'm at an auto body mechanics shop right now um, having some car trouble uh, unexpectedly. So in some ways it's kind of appropriate um, to discuss this in, in the context of that, of, of my setting. But um, I mean, basically like the show prior to this, um, which I think is in a later slide, um, the show prior was, was set in the kind of an imaginary apartment and I kind of felt like I wanted to explore a different interior space um, and, and approach it in an entirely different way, partly because the gallery, the mega gallery in this scenario, um, asked for the artists that show with them to push kind of the boundaries of their practice in ways that were not necessarily comfortable. And, and in my scenario, I felt like uh, the video and the audio components, um, the video being the rear view mirror camera screens. And I think there's a detail of that. Um, and also the audio coming from the speaker shaped ears on the wall. Um, so in, in, a, in a kind of very pragmatic way, this was me kind of exploding all of the components of or the, the essential components, I feel like, of, of an automobile, of a car um, interior, um, and then also having the video and audio components that bring the exterior world of the car back into the inside of the car. And because the gallery is quite small, it's like 15 square meters, um, it also kind of influenced this idea of doing a small confined space and, and you know, approaching the interior world and, and not just an apartment or a home. So there's, you know, in, in this previous slide or, you know, it's, it's uh, there's an inflatable car chair um, that was just sort of based on like a generalized form of a driver's seat. And there's, um, the carpet is uh, inlaid and it's, um, so I'm, I'm having to go back and forth. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So the carpet is uh, laser cut uh, and it's actually the image from the still from the film. 
And, you know, the effort here was just to create a kind of, um, I guess a similar kind of like collage-like effect, um, but, but more in the kind of all the sensory elements of a car and an automobile and passing through a landscape. Um, Yeah, and so here you can see the detail of the, on the right of the um, film, which I shot with, um, in collaboration with Adriana Glaviano, who's a filmmaker who's kind of based between New York and Athens. And she um, traveled with me to North Carolina and shot these films, um, there's six of them in total, that um, display on the car rear view mirror. And uh, the power comes from this box behind, uh, which is like the center console of a car. And it has the uh, cigarette lighter plugs that feed into a central power system that plugs into the wall. And um, there's no audio coming directly from these screens. The audio comes from the ears on the wall. And, and it's, again, like a collage that doesn't necessarily sync with the videos. At times, it sort of does. and at other times, not so much, but um, you know, it's 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 kind of meant to give you a, a sense of you know instability or kind of feel off balance, but at the same time feel like kind of normal amount of information, um, both like visual information, moving you know, image, audio, um, and I feel like you know the. The 21st century version of us is, is capable Canyon, 2008. of uh, accepting this much information. So yeah, this in this slide there is the um, cryptid show from Fort Gansevoort, which was a um, an interior that I created with objects that were meant to. Um, kind of create this like um, fictional character, a fictional client. Um, so I kind of treated myself as like the interior decorator um, for a kind of bodiless, um, you know, not completely identifiable being. And so I didn't have to follow in a lot of scenarios with the objects. Like I didn't have to follow the logic of, you know, typical furniture design or proportion. So like for example, the bed fitting under the dinner table. Um, in this scenario, the body would fit underneath or between, and it doesn't need to be, you know, a human form or an animal form or any kind of form. It's more just an idea. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, like, the materially, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a wide variety of things from my past, like the uh, stick furniture chair, um, you know, the burl wood veneer on the table. It's, it's, again, a kind of sampling of a lot of different um, periods and a lot of different um, materials that, you know, speak to me in, in ways that, you know, I think that like vinyl has a certain connotation when you apply it to, you know, a piece of furniture. It's, is it to protect, you know, is it to like accentuate the form or play down the form? Um, is it to sexualize it? Is it, you know, it's all of these things that I feel like just simply with material, one can, um, you know, manipulate the, the viewer or the experience through just, through just material. These are just a few other um, views from the installation. Um, I'm I'm really interested in the way um, you create characters that are, um, you know, invisible in many ways. Like you 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 have this idea and this concept around. Um, a certain figure or a protagonist 
um, in these installations that you make or furniture forms that you make, but it's for the viewer um, to sort of invent in their mind. You know, you, you leave that part kind of out. Um, and so it invites, you know, the person to really create or be part of this process of, of creating um, the, the scenario, you know, completing the scenario. We have the space that you've invited visitors to come and look at in terms of, you know, what an interior uh, could be for this character, but you don't tell us who this character is, what they look like. Um, I think, you know, the same could be said for the Angus chair, um, you know, chair for a wallflower, for someone who's introverted, you know, who that could be anyone, that could be anything. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting um, idea. Whereas I think Serban, his characters are much more upfront. Like you, you can see the character. You don't necessarily know how the character is using these objects or how um, the character uh, kind of comes together within an interior. I think you see it a little bit more with um, Chapel for an Apple, but even then um, you have a physical space, but those objects are, are separate. They don't come together um, completely yet. Um, maybe that'll be the next uh, iteration for, for Serban for his next project where he creates a complete environment um, so I, I think these are super fascinating um, facets of, of each of your practices that come together in different ways. Um, I especially feel like I think about this a lot when I see this image uh, rep range, you know, I imagine like, who is the person who is <laughs> using these objects, um, you know, particularly thinking about gym culture and um, and lifting weights, uh, especially now where we can't go into gyms, we have a lot of trepidation around interacting with objects that other people would um, be also touching. Um, this is sort of a really interesting installation to think about within our, our current situation. Yeah, and the idea that, you know, the weights for me have a life of their own, um, you know, independent of who might be using them. And, you know, it's like, you know, what does the gym look like when there's no one there? Um, you know, do the, do the weights like take on their own life? Do they lounge about? Like, do they have like a kind of languid, relaxing, kind of muscular life outside of, you know, their function? And so in a sense, I mean, this was just like kind of a, a glimpse into what that world might be like, which, you know, is, is like, you know, is it, is it, could be possible, we don't know. Um, and, it, and it grew out of a piece that was in the cryptid though, um, and it was just to kind of further explore, um, yeah, I mean, these objects that it have, they have a life, but again, it's not to me that they're human, they're just simply gestive of maybe, you know, maybe something human, maybe something else, but I mean, they, to me, there's like a, there's a balance between the, the suggestion of what it might be and then, you know, simply just telling someone, or communicating directly what that is. Um, you know, sometimes it's just to, to point in a direction. So that's kind of what these were to me. And, and you know, they're meant to be playful and to kind of make you smile and, um, you know, again, to, to be lighthearted in a way. Yeah, well, I love I love how like the the objects in that case in that uh, image, Sam. How they're I love this idea that they're coming alive, right? It's the the like like in Toy Story, right? When the 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 people leave the toys party, right? It's this, it's, and in this case, the you know the gym waves, you know, come they do their little thing. But it's also like 
you're speaking to these specific symbols, right, of, of weights of, yeah. you know, which I think, you know, Lapo, just trying to connect it back to Lapo in some way, like Lapo was really much into that idea. You know, he tells, I saw some lecture of his and he was talking about how he made this large uh, spaghetti bowl outside of this church. Uh, and it was this huge, you know, it was like, you know, 100 meters of inflatable spaghetti, I think. And uh, he wanted to make that just for the function of that people, when they leave church, they would go home and eat spaghetti, you know? So it was just this, this idea of like having this object remind you of something, right? Of the, the symbolism of weights, but also kind of bring you into some other state of mind, right? Of the, inf the influence that an object could have. In this case, it's humor, it's movement, it's playfulness. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing installation. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think that like, you know, to, again, I think there's a certain amount that's communicated materially as well, um, just from the simple combination. Like, I think a lot of times people, when they see the image of this installation, they don't know the actual material of the, weights themselves is nylon blocking, which is similar to the material on the inside of a jewelry box um, or like the headlining in an automobile. And so, you know, it's meant to, um, you know, to have, a, to have a kind of softness, a sleekness, like a kind of sensual quality when you, when you touch these things. And I feel like sometimes that's lost in the images that more subtle than say like the vinyl for the chair and so that's you know it's, it's something that I really really care about um, you know even the carpet in this installation is meant to kind of play with you know this idea of the soft sculpture but you know also hard and kind of rigid in its form so Yeah, and these are photos that I took um, in the neighborhood I was living in for some time. And, and they're of uh, awnings that um, inspired this collection of, of lights that I made. Um, and it was really, it was kind of a, it was a very like, sometimes from, from my work, I feel like it's a very simple, you know, thought process, but basically I realized in all these walks I was doing at night would uh, Queens that all of these awnings were basically like house sized night lights. And so I ended up titling this work night lights because to me they were like the little ones that you plug into the socket, you know, in the bathroom, you know, where you brush your teeth or whatever at night. Um, and then in some ways the awning in, in, in this particular sense and in, in its real world application isn't that functional. It really is a kind of way of distinguishing these, you know, very similar kind of tan brick homes that you see throughout many neighborhoods in New York, but specifically in this part of Queens. And it's like each homeowner was able to kind of create their own identity through the combination of paint or form or so forth and so the, the gutter light was a bit just me um, doing that because I thought it would be cool but it was uh, it felt like it needed to be balanced out so maybe that was me being like designer in the sense of the, the overall of how the show looked. This is a series of works that when we came together, we all sort of had a very visceral reaction to it. We all really loved it. Um, you know, in my case, it really reminded me of the neighborhoods outside of Manhattan, residential neighborhoods that are in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn. Um, I lived on a block growing up in the Bronx and every single um, house had one of these awnings um, and every single house was made of red brick and and this was how you sort of uh, you know told your friends like 
I live on the house with the green and yellow or with like the black and white um, awning. And, and it was something that really was very reflective of, of living in these types of neighborhoods in New York that don't get a lot of attention, which is where people live. You know, it's not necessarily where people go out to party or to hang out. It's where um, everyday New Yorkers live their lives um, and go home after what is usually a very long commute. Um, and so what I also thought was interesting about these pieces was, was the scale because you, you call them a nightlight. Um, and from the image, it looks like they could be the size of a nightlight, but they're quite big. They're bigger than a, a nightlight. Yeah, I mean, I think this is where Servan and I have a similar you know, interest in form and, and what I suggest. Um, I mean, these are, between you know it's basically like halfway between an actual sized awning and the you know plug in the wall like plastic one and I think it's um it's something I've done in other works and I feel like it's hard to determine whether they're a toy um whether they you know are life-size scale I constantly get asked that question and for me that's that's a nice space to land because in some ways if you have for me, if you have too much distraction from the object itself about whether it's the actual size or so forth, that that can actually lead to like, a, you know, a, an interesting space to like think about the work and, and what and why we make things the size we do and what that suggests about being an adult or being a child or, you know, what it suggests about architecture that these homes were, you know, adorned or decorated with these very kind of you know could be utilitarian but sort of are not either and, and you know a lot of them have lights underneath them as well so it, it was all very me being very literal um, but then again yeah just playing with with the sense of scale um, you know that the, the thing is too is like I really approach these about the paint as well and, and the design of the like patterning and to me that was like if I simplified the actual material and, and, and used wood rather than like the sheet metal um, I could kind of draw more attention to like the beauty of the like graphic quality of the paint on a lot of these actual awnings um, the, the green and white striped one that's closest to the red gutter shaped lamp is actually like the, the candy store in the Lower East Side. So that was like the one that was like kind of not in Queens, but there was a fabric awning. Um, but I really like the kind of like, you know, urine type striking pattern um, in, in the sense of these as a painting too, because the awnings to me were really suggestive of paintings, um, independent of their form or their design. And this is just a detail of, of two of them. And so in, in thinking about New York, um, and when we were having this conversation um, in preparation for this for this talk, I, I said to Serban, Serban, we, we need something that reflects your New York. Um, Serban and I often bond over being um, New Yorkers growing up in New York. I'm a native New Yorker and Serban um, came to New York uh, quite young. And so that was our initial connection was growing up in New York City living in the outer boroughs, um, you know, being a teenager and running around Manhattan um, and, and living our adult life now um, in New York City. And so I thought this was a really great project that, that really touched upon living in New York, um, a crowded room. Serving, so you wanna talk a, a, a bit about this and then um, we'll probably show two more slides and then wrap up so we can open it up to questions. 
Yeah, it, it's funny. The the Sam awnings, like my parents have on their house in Queens, they have two green awnings, one on the side, one in the front. So it's it's it was always the house with the two green awnings, you know, to how you recognize it amongst all the other brick houses. So I, I'm so familiar with that. I, I remember when I saw that show in um, on the Bowery, I remember I just I loved it. It was such a such a it brought me back to this like nostalgia of growing up and seeing those like ignoring those ugly things and now like seeing them in this beautiful light. And I think Sammy achieved that so well. Uh, and and with this show, this was a uh, Larry on on Orchard Street, uh, rest in peace, uh, the gallery. And um, this this for me, it was a in one of the old tenements. In, of the Lower East Side, which I spent most of my teenage years, I went to high school in Midtown and we would run downtown and cause chaos on Rivington and Orchard and all those streets. But um, so it was kind of going back to this idea. And I was, I was parallel to that, I was reading a little bit of Jacob Rees and came upon this idea of, of a crowded room. And, you know, we're all familiar with those Lower East Side tenement photographs that Jacob Rees took uh, of, you know, people on top of each other, this kind of which is New York. It's the most New York thing about New York, right? It's that we're not really supposed to be <laughs> together in this way, but we somewhat manage, we've agreed on something to work together. Um, and so this was an installation I did, and I wanted to think about how can I also speak a little bit of the transient time? How can I bring time into that idea of the crowded room? Because people come from different places. People have, have, travel through some through this kind of time vest vessel as well so i created this 20-foot tunnel in this in a small lower east side gallery so i even made the space even smaller again to keep that kind of kind of claustrophobia a little bit and within that i kind of put my cast of characters i put some drawings of mine i've put it was the first time i did a folk chair so it was kind of it was kind of like a Someone told me, don't say this ever again, but I'm gonna say it again. It was a, a poo-poo platter of, of stuff, you know? It was kind of like a, when you go to the, the Chinese American restaurant and you're, you're ordering all the, all the, a little bit of everything. So it was a little bit of everything that I was doing at that time and I was stumbling upon. So I wanted to, again, create that diversity of sorts in this, in this kind of crowded room. So people went inside the space, you know, maybe bumped into each other, bumped into the pieces a little bit very lightly. But I wanted to kind of create this. And, uh, the yellow piece uh, was an installation of showing that these are kind of like a cast of characters. Like these are actually, and you will see it in, a, in I guess, the final slide of the presentation. There's two more, but uh, it was this animation where all the pieces kind of come alive, and there there's personalities to them. They're moving around. So this was again like entering that that an object performs. And okay. Subin, why don't we? Uh, skip over to the animation um, and then we'll end on Sam. I love it. Yeah, we, you know, and I'll talk a little bit through it. There is, uh, so in that kind of yellow object, there was this kind of animation that I did with uh, uh, virtual artist Narika Borgen and also Queens native, Queens in the house. But uh, so this was kind of bringing some of the objects that were in the space kind of alive. So you can see the blue chair coming in the left-hand corner and Annie, you could see Annie in the top right. So it was just a way of kind of, how can I animate these objects? And this was kind of bringing personalities, right? Like in those photographs of the Crowder Room by Jacob Reese, those people were from Ireland, from Italy, from, from all around the world. And it, there, there were, they agreed to work together. Again, like a microcosm of what New York City is now. And I kind of was thinking of my work at that time, that was from 2018, of this kind of microcosm of all these different things. And the video was a way for me to, uh, to show the potential of these things. And you can see in the video, it has all these tunnels, which the tunnel was connecting back to the tunnel. And the idea of the tunnel was, I wanted to create this kind of tight, narrow space that wasn't static, that it was about movement. Tunnels are about movement. Bridges are about, you know, moving. And there's never this kind of perfect moment. And, and I myself being an immigrant, I'm always, I, you know, I feel like I'm always moving. I, I feel like I might not belong, even if I do belong in a place, I still feel like I'm moving. And here they're gonna do a little like, tying back to you, Sam, they're gonna do a little Matisse dance. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, this was, uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sir, and I was curious if you could say, it's funny, it's like the most obvious thing, but I feel like we've never really talked about color um, and kind of what informs your use of color. Well, I look at color as a, as a form of the same way, like I, I make my drawings, it's a little bit impulsive, like at least the, this, like I allow my just instincts to guide me there, but I also, um, I did black and white works for, I don't know, maybe, five, seven years prior to maybe four or five years ago. So when I started doing color, it was really, I really embraced it. It was as if I was alone on an island for all those years and all of a sudden I'm, I'm in civilization. So I'm trying foods, I'm trying mangoes, I'm trying, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I look at color as, as, a, as, a, as a form, it's a, it's a medium of, of excitement that I'm allowing to kind of, kind of to embrace and bring in, you know, and it's, it's, a lot of it is emotional, a lot of it is, um, it, it's important for me for the pieces to be a little bit monochromatic. I'm bringing, I'm bringing now different colors, but I, I look at color in that way. And Sam, we're gonna end with you um, with a, uh, well, I'll let you set it up. Yeah, so this was um, also a collaboration um, with the filmmaker Adriana Glaviano again. Um, this was actually before the show in Italy, and we chose a day to shoot this lamp that I had for kind of an entirely different context for a show in um, Brooklyn at uh, Winter Czech Zebulon studio. And um, I'd continue to produce these after the show, and, and one of the things I wanted to do was to make a, a short film where I love it. Did we lose Sam? I think so. <laughs> Poor Sam. Um, Sam, for for our audience to know, Sam uh, was driving from North Carolina to um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And along the way, uh, ran into some car trouble. So he thought he would be participating from beautiful Santa Fe, but um, has since had to sort of make do um, as he's been waiting for his car um, at the mechanics shop. So um, we wanted to end with with those two uh, videos because we really wanted to sort of end this conversation 
with thinking about design, not just as function um, and as artistic expression, but also how design can be used as a tool of performance. Um, and, and we thought that was a great way to, to link back to the practice of um, Lapo Benazi and so many of his uh, contemporaries who were, you know, that we now know as the Italian radicals. Um, so, so with that said, um, Serban, Sam, if you have any final uh, thoughts, um, here's your chance. And if not, we'll, we'll open it up to our um, audience members for questions. I, I guess I could say something. I stumbled upon this, this Lapo Binazi quote where, you know, I think is the radical Italian movement for me was, I remember when I stumbled upon Gaetano Pesci and all these other designers, it was, it was a, a really refreshing moment to being like, hey, I could, design could exist in these other, in these other ways. And I remember he, I stumbled upon a quote of his where it was, uh, uh, the, this type of, this movement will constantly be rediscovered because it's a, it's a, it's a tank of energy or it's an energy tank. And I, and I really love that idea because it is, you know, if you look at some of that radical stuff, I feel like what I'm doing is in that lineage is something, it's a little bit different as well, of course, but, um, but that energy is there, right? It's an energy of camp, of, of, uh, of, of testing certain things that has a certain uh, social and political kind of, kind of background as well that it exists in, which we didn't discuss much, but, um, but I think it's this this energy that's kind of that that's almost timeless, right? The the energy of the like, it's maybe it's an offshoot of the design world, but it's this energy that's I feel it existed in the '60s and I feel it exists today in 2020. Can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I I think yeah, just to add to that, like. I mean, I'm not like super, um, you know, well read with the you know, radical design movement, but I feel like, you know, from what I do know, that it's a very similar spirit to the work. And, you know, in the way that we think about materials and proportions, but, you know, I feel like what they were doing then was so um, also interesting how it kind of precipitated, at least with, you know, the scene in Florence with the student protest movements, and it kind of felt very, from, from what I've read, very political um, in, its, in its foundations. And I feel like, it's not to say that we are like apolitical in our work, but I feel like it's coming from a similar spirit, but maybe less you know, motivated by, you know, a specific reason or a specific response. Um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm speaking just for myself, but what, I mean, that's, that's where I really see kind of maybe a difference that aesthetically there's something similar happening, but maybe on a conceptual um, foundation, there's two kind of different things happening. Sure. Um, okay, so should we open it up to um, the public now for some questions? Sure, yeah. I think there's a few questions right there. I see there's three in the Q&A. I was just... Uh, Okay. With regards to Sam's audio, I see the Q and A is uh, from Todd. Your quality is very bad. Sam needs to mute. <laughs> from Justin, he takes it back. He said, "Here, he said you're very sweet." Can you see the? Can you see them, Sam? The Q and A. So, if anyone has any questions, feel free. If not, we could. Oh, 
I would have left that out then. I guess not. That's, oh. Oh, wait, here we go. Um, Serban, you identified some of your pieces as being your pets. Is there an emotional connection with each one of them? And how does that play and emerges during your creation process? Uh, hi, Clara, how are you? And uh, yes, you know, they're, they're, but it's, it's, more, it's more than that. It, it, it exists in this space where it's not so, um, I'm not so conscious, right? I, uh, my good friend, painter, Ron Gorchoff, you know, he would talk about his paintings in a way that, uh, you know, he would, you know, uh, if people are fam aren't familiar with them, there are these kind of shaped paintings that are very constructed, very designed to how they're made. But then he would, you know, when he painted these paintings, it was just a few, two, three minutes that the painting would go. And he talked about that, that he didn't, like, he was in charge up until that point. And there was a certain, after, after the painting was stretched and put on the wall, something else, or something else takes over. I don't know if I, um, I'm always conscious of how connected I am to them, how, where do they come from? So they do exist in this kind of, this zone where I'm, I, I don't really know how to define it. And I'm not connected. I am connected to them, very much connected, but I also allow them to, to, to uh, you know, you have to let them go and they go into the world and others enjoy them. And then a comment from Lisa, very inspiring, love the childlike play and exploration and all of the work. Um, I have a question for, for the two of you. Um, how do you think your work is going to change? Um, do you see it changing? Um, either in uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic or some of the other uh, social inequality um, issues that have been coming up, you know, particularly all of the uh, events regarding racial injustice in the United States. Um, and, and frankly, just the, the way we interact with our interiors now that we are sort of faced with having to spend more time in them. Do you see the work changing or, or responding to some of that? Absolutely. I, I think, like, I, I've written, I, I think Hannah Martin wrote a, a piece for kind of like the future of design for, I think, for Clever. But, uh, and in that, I, I was thinking about, like, how we have to kind of look at objects in certain ways. I feel us as designers, we have the responsibility of, uh, of, of taking all of that in consideration, what's happening socially, politically, but not everything is social and political. As a designer, I, I still think like there is something, you know, there is a larger time span as well. I think we have to be conscious of that. Uh, but because of this, I think people have to educate themselves and kind of recurate their living environments. I think architects have to redesign what every house should have a backyard if we can't go outside every house should have a, a garden or a kitchen a larger kitchen if we can't uh you know if we can't go to the restaurant you know so like all these different spaces have to you know have to kind of maybe the pandemic goes away but these these ideas still need to be there and uh of course i think the designers but also I think the audience needs to, or the consumers or whoever they are, have to also educate themselves and look at objects differently. <laughs> hey, Sam. S Sam, did you wanna make a comment? Did You're muted. Sam, you're muted. Um, so do you mind repeating the question one more time? You cut off right as you were saying, I have a question for the two of you. Oh, sure. So my question was, how do you see the work, your work changing or responding to um, the current uh, health pandemic with COVID-19, now that we're spending so much time 
indoors and and in our homes um and if you also see the work sort of changing or responding to some of the um uh, social and and racial injustices um and and uh, responses that have been happening across the nation around that too right i mean i feel like um you know for me the the work is very specifically about um kind of observation about living in the city um and you know a lot of the information I take from from you know just purely walking around and and being a kind of um, you know being a citizen but also being an observer and I think that um, you know the you know the the reality is is like it can't be divorced from you know being part of um, you know political system a political nature and I think that. Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, the, the focus, at least in the last few months, has been so much more localized and so much more like hyper focused, just simply for the fact that my world is very much kind of narrowed into a very specific place. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that kind of focus in a certain sense is good and introduces new information to the work. I feel like it does for me take some time to process what exactly that is on a on like a kind of conceptual framework but i feel like yeah i mean i think you know i'm very aware and i'm and i'm observing what's um you know what's happening and i think that those those changes find their way into the work um you know no matter what um you know the health pandemic to me feels very abstract still in the sense of um you know how that relates to what I'm making or what I made before, but I feel like inevitably that finds again its way, um, you know, into your psyche and into how you make work and how you, you know, whether it's logistics or whether it's conceptual or you know any number of reasons. Um, but I'm I'm a firm believer that all of these influences find their way in. Um, it's harder sometimes to draw for me like a direct correlation between one event and something that I particularly am thinking about or making, but I think in kind of a general sense it is. Great. Um, one more question came in. Um, Serbin, I miss you. Architecture is photographic. Do you feel that your sculptural work is also photographic? or cinematic and uh, and that a photo of a work changes it, kill or kills it. Love, Johnny. Johnny, uh, I miss you too. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I like the, the cast of characters I'm always thinking about um, is from cinema, is my interest of cinema. Even some of the installations that I've created is from my interest in cinema and I, I never I never I guess photography you know it, it's funny how photography has morphed today right photography exists and it's you know on our phones everything is is documented so much and at the end of the day it's just a photograph right so like so many amazing beautiful architecture pieces exist only in photographs because we can't reach let's say Casa Malaparte or we can't reach Ville Savoie within immediacy but through photography we can so I, I think a little bit of that that's why I even sometimes photograph my works on just white backgrounds I like that they exist in this kind of neutral zone um, but I'm thinking more and more of not having that neutral zone um, but yeah, I think I think it's I, I want them to be a little more activated, maybe through cinema, and that's you know that's I think that's the, the next iteration is how that's going to happen. Okay, and um, maybe this might be our last question. Uh, what are you working on right now, both of you, from Susan? Sammy, go ahead. Uh, well, mostly my work right now is um, commission based. Um, you know, the, the, 
work I was kind of focusing on prior to the pandemic was kind of more motivated by shows uh, with galleries. And so more specifically, I would say I'm making a lot of dining tables. Um, and, you know, these have like a certain, you know, they, they share a lot of similarities with the work that I've made and kind of the gallery context, but sometimes the focus is a bit more on function. Um, but materially and formally, I'm still trying to like push the, you know, boundaries of that work um, in ways that, you know, engage me. Um, and then beyond that, I'm making some things that are um, going to be for some show in the future. I'm not sure, but but it's, uh, it's a mixture of kind of shaker inspired objects and some like kind of backyard type furniture <laughs> is the most I can say because it's not fully developed yet. But I think the, the interest kind of continue to develop um, over time. And so um, there'll be more updates soon. And I'm uh, kind of like that as well because of the pandemic. Did you guys, you didn't pull it out, did you? No, not yet. We're um, still, I've been, we're still here. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was Evan, uh, but uh, I, I think because of the pandemic, a lot of things have shifted and I'm in Canada, guys, so I, I'm working on small things. I'm working on a small things. I'm painting. I'm working on a smaller sculptures like wall sculptures and uh, but I'm working and building maquettes of other projects. So I'm taking this time as a way because everything has shifted and moved. So as a way of just kind of working for shows, working, creating a body of work for shows on a smaller scale, a little bit more abstract, and, and also thinking about more chapels. Like chapel for apples. Yes, <laughs> maybe for other things, chapel for a <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Sam, Serban. Thank you, R and Company. Thank you so much, Evan, for inviting us. Um, and thank you all for, for being on this journey with us, this hour and a half. We're so appreciative of your time and your attention and your um, enthusiasm um, as we walk through all of this really fascinating work. Thank you, Christina, so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Sam. Bye, y'all. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>